what do you think are the main principles that have allowed you to stay young and thrive as you've aged? You know, interesting question, um, because it's a range of um, thought patterns more than principles. I've tried to think young uh, my whole life. When I was young, I was young. But when I got older, I hung out with younger people. Much of what I do now is based on not so much younger people as youthfulness. So I hang around with people who are youthful, who love to live, who uh, are interested in working out and moving and playing games and enjoying life uh, and being productive uh, and making a contribution and all of these things that sort of, I think, necessary to give someone a reason to get out of bed every morning. I mean, I think one of the things that happens with old people is, and starting as early as like, you know, 40s and 50s sometimes is, you know, you lose your, your what for, you lose your motivation. And it doesn't have to be your passion. It doesn't have to be, you know, something that you, you know, discover along the way, but there should be a reason that you're excited to get up every day and go do something. And I think, you know, so that the, the energy of staying in motion, you know, things stay in motion uh, in the universe and they, and they last longer, uh, you know, entropy and, and um, this lack of energy is a, is a slippery slope to a, to a short life and possibly to a life that's not that healthy. I mean, I see so many people my age, I mean, I'm 71, I'll be 71 in three days. And, you know, when I was a kid, that was old, man, that was, that was ancient. And now I'm like, you know, I I literally feel like I'm in my late thirties in terms of, you know, how I move about the world. So attitude is just huge and, and more so than really any other, any of the other hacks and, you know, the diet, we could talk about the diet and the exercise and the, and the avoidance of traumatic experiences and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really attitude. If so many people, they, they miss that part, right? They're looking for all these quick hacks, quick fixes to change their health and improve their life. But if their attitude and perspective on life isn't one that's like optimistic, more on the positive side, like none of that other stuff matters because life is going to happen. And if you aren't able to take a step back and look at things objectively, I think you'll find yourself in a bit of trouble. Like what are some of the, the attitude shifts that you've had to make in your career or in your life that have really helped you stay young? Things like acceptance of things being the way they are. I think the idea that things are not happening to me they're happening around me and I have the agency with which to affect them and change things. That's always been a big deal for me. So that, that was a kind of a life lesson. It's, it's, I think it embodied in the phrase, this too shall pass, right? When, when bad things are going on in your life, I know you've, you've had that experience, right? And bad things go on in people's lives all the time. And, and things that I would consider horrible in my life, other people might think, oh, that's nothing compared to what you know, what's gone on in my life. But everybody has their own, you know, their own set of events that happen that causes them to think, oh, my God, this is horrible. How am I going to overcome this? And and at the end of the day, it's again, it's your attitude. It's, it's this notion that this too shall pass. It's this idea that life is 10 percent about what happens to us and 90 percent about how we deal with it. I, I see a lot of it today in the younger generations and it, it it bothers me and it and it and it pains me to see a mental kind of state that young people have like one of a nihilism like what am, how am i going to survive in this world how am i going to make my way how am i going to keep up with the influencers on instagram how am i going to do all these things well you know it it really comes down to your own personal Choices and again, your own ability to um, change your attitude, rally your you know resources, and roll up your sleeves, dig in, and fix whatever it is that you need to fix, and and do whatever it is you need you need to do uh, without having sort of a victim attitude or without being even kowtowing to the notion that oh my god, this is fate and it's my lot in life and. I have no say in this. Look, I grew up in a small fishing village in Maine. It, you know, as the saying used to go, we were poor, but we didn't know it. And everybody in that town that I grew up in had, you know, didn't have a pot to piss in really. But 
everybody was kind of happy and going about their way. And that's, this is New England. It's cold in the winters and it's, and it's a, it's, it's rustic. It's a hard life to live. And that forges strong people and strong, you know, hard men, you know, create hard times or hard times create hard men and hard men create good times. And, you know, so I, I look back on the adversity as being my greatest trainer. And I, and then I chose adversity. I mean, like I chose to be an endurance athlete where my entire career as a runner was all about managing discomfort and pain, whether it's working out training every day, managing discomfort, or whether it's getting into a race and going up against some of the best runners in the country, managing discomfort, how uncomfortable am I willing to make myself in order to, to, to exceed at this particular challenge? Well, that carries through in the rest of your life. How uncomfortable am I willing to make myself to start a business or to you know start a nonprofit or to find a way to make a contribution or to uh, go up to a cute person at a at, you know in a room and introduce myself with the hopes that maybe there's a relationship there. These are all you know sort of the the, the choices that that we have to make in order to get ahead, in order to succeed, in order to, to to you know, climb out of that hole and to hopefully improve our lot in life. And I see a lot of people unwilling to make those choices. They're just sort of stuck in the comfort of the, you know, the, the cocoon that they've put themselves in. Does that make sense? I'm sorry if I'm... No, totally. I, I, don't, I don't wax that philosophical that often, Doug. So. <laughs> it's all good. I love it. Yeah. I mean, no, it's it's totally true. And I talk about this a lot that... You know, as cliche as it can be to say that things are happening for you and not to you, there's no other option. Because if you just look at life as things are happening to me, and then you get trapped in the victim mindset, you give all of your power away to somebody else, to other things, to your circumstances. And then you're kind of, in a way, forcing yourself not to change because, and there's commodity in that, there's currency in that. Because, like, I look at my story and you know, my parents were divorced. I was bullied. Like a lot of things that I guess people would look at me and say, oh, you had it tough. And that led to me just rationalizing and justifying a lot of unhealthy behaviors in my life because I was getting attention from the validation of, you know, feeling sorry for myself. And that got me in jail. And it wasn't until I had that, this wake up call that I needed to be the one to change myself that really forced me to, to make that transition and to change and to get into something like fitness. And, I know that fitness obviously has been a huge player in your life. I mean, it's been your career and I think it can be like, it's, I think it's the most underutilized tool when it comes to recovering from things like drug addiction, improving your mental health. I mean, just in, is, there's so many parallels, like you mentioned about being a runner and being just uncomfortable with how that transfers to other parts of life. But looking back now, you've had a lot of experience in the space like, what do you think matters most as far as fitness, given that everything that you've done in your your life? You know, I I, I think it's a two pronged attack in terms because I don't I don't always look at fitness as performance. I look at fitness as life fitness, fit for life, which then you know um, sort of coincides with health to a certain extent. So diet is a is a crucial aspect, and it always has been my focal point. Uh, get the diet right, right? Get the crap out of your diet and kind of focus on being a good intuitive eater and understanding how your body works and understanding, you know, how certain foods react with your particular system. Um, So dial that in. And then on the exercise side, once you've, once you've addressed the diet part of this, the metabolic side of this, the metabolic flexibility side, it doesn't take a lot of hard exercise to be fit. It takes a lot of low level stuff like walking. I've got a new book coming out in um, October. It's called uh, Born to Walk. And it really is an indictment of the running boom of the 50s or the last 50 years and how inappropriate it is for most people to be running. Most people should be walking and walking a lot, right? So people should be walking, sprinting, and lifting weights. And those are sort of the three categories that I first described in the Primal Blueprint 20 years ago. Do a lot of low-level activity. They call it zone two now, zone one and zone two. But at the time, it was just low-level 
fat burning activity, not finding 45 minutes once a day, five days a week. I'm talking about as, mu as much as you can throughout the day, whether it's pacing on the, on the phone while you're making phone calls or going for long walks uh, at lunch or after dinner, finding ways to move. And it could be cycling. It could be swimming. It could be a lot of things, but finding ways to move at a low level of aerobic output. And then, and then just lifting weights two or three times a week. Don't need to do much more than that, but, but be focused, make it count, you know, make those workouts be such that your body responds in a way that wants to build muscle and burn fat and, and improve metabolic flexibility. One of the problems that people have with, with working out is it becomes such a quote habit that they lose the notion of the, why they started doing this in the first place. If you lift weights in the gym to get stronger, there's a process by which your muscles respond to that work and requ it requires some rest in between. So working out every day, I know so many people go to the gym every day and, you know, sort of do the same workout, repeat the same workout. And, you know, that's a great habit, but that's not getting you toward a, uh, a fitter performance type goal. And again, I'm not, I don't mean to say that don't do that, but if you're, if you want to, optimize your fitness, the best way to do it is to work out fewer times a week and just work out harder for shorter periods of time when you do work out and then let the body recover in between. So that's one of the discoveries I've made over the years is that I, you know, I used to beat myself up and train 10, 15, sometimes 25 hours a week when I was a triathlete. And that's all it's doing is beating your body up. The body knows how to run fast and ride fast and swim reasonably fast. Um, and, and all I was doing was practicing hurting for that race day. Well, I didn't need to practice hurting because I already knew how to hurt. So the last two decades for me have been about the minimum effective dose of exercise. How do I, how do I stay fit with the least amount of pain and suffering and sacrifice and discipline and portion control and calorie counting and all that other, shit? how do I, how do I optimize my time in the gym? So that I now, because I'm older, I'm not going to have any, I'm not going to set any personal records from here, but so I don't decline, you know, as much as the typical decline, which starts at the age of 35 or 40 for some people. So at my workout schedule now, like I've got a guest staying with me here and he's 65 and he trains four and a half to five hours a day. And I'm like, dude, well, like, like, how can you even do that? Well, it's just in his psyche and he drives himself crazy if he doesn't do that. I've learned how to, um, you know, find that sweet spot that what I call that minimum effective dose of exercise such that when I do work out, I work out hard enough that I don't want to work out again later in the day. I don't do two a days anymore and I don't want to, um, and I don't want to do it again tomorrow. So I'm on a, I'm in the South of France right now and I'm, I'm on a four day split. I've got a run, a run day. I've got a walk day, which for me is two and a half hours of hard hiking. I walk every day and I walk, but a, a, a hard hike day, a lifting day, uh, a cycling day and a stand up paddling day. And so those different four, I wrote those, rotate those four days and each one kind of gives me that, that body part or that area that I'm focusing on a break to get through the next day and the next day and the next day. But again, I only do it once a day. You know, I'm not aggressively doing two a days and I'm happy to, you know, I, I wanted to get it all done before lunch so that the rest of the day is, you know, for other, other pursuits. Have you, have you realized that, you know, since you've cut back, I guess, on the volume of resistance training and not doing the two a days, have you noticed that you've been able to maintain muscle mass, the same amount of muscle mass throughout the process? Yeah. I mean, I think I think maintaining muscle mass, you know, is a great goal. It's it's probably my primary goal. I'm not going to compete at anything anymore. I've lost all interest in competing. So it really is about maintaining muscle mass. But you know, like for instance, uh, VO2 max has become a big topic of discussion in the last year. You know, Peter Ortiz has made a big deal of it, and and you know, Andy Galpin and and Huberman, they've all talked about VO2 max, and it's true. But I think. As so often happens in this arena that we play in, this kind of biohacking, anti-aging, longevity arena, we can get too caught up in those numbers as well. And 
like I had my VO2 max tested about two months ago. And um, I tested in the top 5% of my age group. And it took me off because I wanted to be in the top, you know, 0.1% of my age group because I used to be a strong endurance athlete. Uh, but then I remembered a couple of things. First off, VO2 max, after a certain point, there's no longevity benefits to an to a increasingly higher and higher VO2 max. And after a certain point, if you're just chasing that number, you sacrifice strength and muscle mass to increase VO2 max because VO2 max is expressed as uh, milliliters per kilogram per minute. So to give you an example, when I tested uh, at uh, 38 for my age at 70, which puts me in the top 5%, uh, if I'd weighed 10, no, 15 kilos less than I weigh now, which is what I weighed when I was tested high as a, as a high VO2 max in my late 20s when I was a marathoner, if I'd weighed that same weight that when I was a marathoner, my VO2 2 max would have been 45, and that would have put me in the top 0.01%. Meanwhile, I've got this extra muscle mass that now serves me extremely well because I'm strong and I'm agile and I can sprint. And I can, you know, I can dead hang for uh, a minute and a half. I can do three minute planks. I can deadlift one and a half times my body weight, 10 times. I can bench press my body weight five times. So all of these different metrics, I can balance on one foot with my arms crossed and my eyes closed for 30 seconds or 40 seconds or 45 seconds. When in fact, the, you know, the, 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 the metric uh, for my age is if you can do it for more than five seconds, you're good, right? So I'm, I want to I want to combine a totality of strength and balance and resilience and VO2 max and body index, all of the metrics, the, the physical parameters, as well as the the lab parameters so that in totality, I don't think there's any 70 year old that can keep up with, or not many right now. Now I'm one in probably 10,000 70 year olds who can do all those things rather than one in a thousand who has a. A VO2 max that's off the charts, but can't can't even play a racket sport because their knees will twist or they're not strong enough to to bench press half their body weight. You know what I mean? It's like you give up a lot of these other areas just focusing on this one number that you read about in a book and chasing that VO2 max. Speaking of driving ourselves crazy, I think it's easy to do right now with nutrition. And I know that you know, you were like a pioneer in the paleo space and eating super clean and eating mostly whole foods and stuff like that. And I think right now there's so much confusion in the nutrition space to where it's gotten, I think, just a bit out of control where people don't even know if they can go into the grocery store and buy any food anymore because of some of the stuff that's there. From a minimum effective dose standpoint, what are the things that you found to, you know, stand the test of time when it comes to nutrition? Protein is king. Always has been for me. And you can overdo that too, right? I mean, uh, when you talk to Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, and she's amazing, and she's one ripped person, you know, she talks about uh, one gram of protein per pound of body mass. And that's for me is 170 grams of protein. I've, I haven't had 170 grams of protein for 30 years. I can't do it. It's too much food. Uh, but I still, I still focus on protein first. So one of the reasons I keep low body fat is my calorie intake is kind of limited by my food choices, which are which are described by identifying protein first. So every meal I'm at, I'm looking for a source of protein. It doesn't have to be lean protein. It can be fatty ribeye steak. I don't care. It's That's not the issue for me. Um, and then some accompanying vegetable or maybe a starchy tuber, but I don't eat a lot of food. I really have have developed this metabolic flexibility that allows me to <clears throat> get through life with anywhere from on an average 1,800 to 2,500 uh, calories a day. Some days I might do 3,000 or something if, but you know, I'll, I'll, that's overdoing it and I'll pay for it the next day just with feeling kind of funky. I don't take in a lot of calories, but if, you know, if you do the math and you go 100 
20 grams of protein a day, which is a, an average, maybe an average good day for me, it's only 480 calories right there. And if you're eating a lot of vegetables and they're not, you're not eating a lot of processed foods, you're probably not getting more than 150 grams of carbs there. Well, that's 600 calories. Now we're only at 1,080 calories and the rest has to be made up with fat. If that's the dressing on a salad or if that's butter on a, you know, on, on some vegetables or whatever. And, you know, I, I have a glass or two of wine every night with dinner. It gets me to my 2,200 or whatever calories. It's not a lot of food and it works for me and it tastes great. I, every meal I eat, I love, I, I look forward to eating, but I don't overeat. I don't get to the point where I'm like, holy, I, I should have stopped like, you know, two courses ago. I don't, I don't think in those terms. I just think in terms of like, oh, I think I finished eating. I think I'm no longer hungry for the next bite. And that's a skill that I would love to impart to every person who ever reads anything that I write. Like that's one of the great life skills, because if you can get to that point where you know that you've had enough food, you're not going to die of starvation. There's going to be another meal at some point, but for this meal, you're done. You know, we would probably cut the start right there and cut the nation's medical bill in half. So you're somebody that, you know, again, has just kept yourself like super fit, super lean, low level percentage of body fat. Like you mentioned, a lot of people right now, that's their goal is to lose body fat, right? And to control what they eat more. Anything that has been like some longstanding habits for you that have helped you maintain like a low level of body fat percentage in a world where it's easy to overeat certain foods or to, to cheat on your diet, et cetera. You know, I, I was also one of the first people to write popularly about intermittent fasting. And I think I've been a fan of compressed eating windows for 20 years. I kind of stumbled upon it because I just wake up in the morning and I have enough energy that I don't feel like eating breakfast. It just doesn't appeal to me. Uh, so I've been doing two meals a day for at least two decades, probably longer now. And in, in doing that, you recognize that giving your body 16 to 18 hours between calorie intake forces your body to burn off its stored body fat. You're not going to be burning off the food you ate. You're going to be burning off your own stored body fat. And that's the, the greatest way to start to cut into those body fat stores. Sprinting, I'm telling you, I've said it for 30 years, nothing cuts you up like sprinting. And it isn't like you have to go out and sprint hard and fast and long every day. No, once a week, if you can engage in some form of sprinting, which I define as 20 to 40 seconds of all out activity after a warm up, obviously warm up for 10 or 15 minutes, 20 to 40 seconds, it could be in in my case, it could be two minutes or three minutes at some point of all out intensity and a two or three minute rest in between and do that four, five, six times in a single workout, you will be truly knackered and you will prompt your body to go into a, uh, a mode where it, you know, starts to burn that excess body fat, builds that metabolic machinery to try and replace the calories you just burn from your own body fat. It's a, it's an amazing tool that once again, gets, I think, overdone by some people who think if a little is good, a lot must be great. And I see people who read what I've written about sprinting and they say, well, Mark, I'm sprinting four days a week. I'm like, yeah, then you're not doing it right. Because if you can sprint four days a week, you put it this way. If you can, if you sprint once a week, you shouldn't be able to or want to be able to do it for another three days at least, right? It should, it should, it should have that effect on you of like, okay, I could do it, but I don't want to do it because it's it was pretty intense. It should the sprint day should scare you a little bit, just like leg day used to scare, you know, guys in the gym, right? You th I know I know guys bodybuilders and and uh, and uh, Olympic lifters, you know, who wake up on leg day and throw up a little bit before they can head to the gym because they're so nervous. But yeah, so you gotta you gotta you know, when you choose those kinds of workouts. And again, we're, we're, we're injecting these into a very convenient, comfortable, hedonistic life. The reason I, 
I even advocate sprinting as it was part of the human experience, uh, unwilling for uh, millions of years where you would run for your life away from something that was trying to kill you. And you only had 20 or 30 or 40 seconds to be able to run that fast and scramble to a tree or hide behind a rock or whatever, or sprint towards something that you wanted to get to, you know, to, to kill for, for lunch. Sprinting has always been part of the human experience, and it's what our genes expect of us, but not every day, just once in a while. You mentioned that you used to do two-a-days and just really crush it in the gym, and now you've found your something that works for you to kind of keep your muscle mass, keep yourself healthy, keep yourself at a low level of body uh, fat percentage. Is there anything like else that comes to mind that you think you like over-indexed on that you, that you shouldn't have? That's a good question. Did I, what did I over-index on? I mean, I learned from the overtraining – for sure that it's counterproductive. Like, I, and I see it now. I see in uh, athletes that I've coached or athletes that I, that I currently coach, I see it in, in my friend who's visiting. Who, he, I, I, you know, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but do you watch uh, Body by Mark? Do you know Body by Mark on uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Instagram? All right, so he's, he's been featured on Body by Mark. He's, he's a guy who, again, claims to train four and a half hours a day. And he does. He lives in my building in, in Miami. And so I see him. He's, he, he, he works out. He runs. It's he not runs Dan Butner. It's not, it's not Dan Butner, is it? Oh, although Dan's my upstairs neighbor. Yeah, I know. I, I know you guys are neighbors. Yeah. I'm joining Dan in, in Italy next week for a couple of days. So I have, when I'm in Miami, my toughest workout of the week is my fat bike ride on the beach. So I have a fat tire bike. We ride on the sand for an hour and a half. And it's brutal because usually it's hot out and there's three of us that go. Um, and uh, my friend Peter, who's, who just joined us here um, today and, uh, and everyone's, and Michael comes with us and <clears throat> Peter and I go all out and we'll go hour and a half. My friend will just, you know, he'll, he'll, he's strong. He's fit. He's really fit, but he won't, he, he won't keep up with us because he's pacing himself for the next for the for the for the run he's going to do in the afternoon and the two hours of tennis he's going to play later on in the day, and and I look at my fat bike ride on Saturdays as man when that's done it's time to you know hit the beach and take a nap and and that's it for the day. I mean it's it, it's exhausting and I want it to be exhausting because it's intended to be a really tough workout and it's my only. I wouldn't say my only tough workout, but it's the toughest workout I do of the week. And that's like the only VO2 max work kind of st stuff that I do. But my point is that my friend, the other friend who trains so much, he, he overtrains. He's literally overtrained and he hasn't really, can't really progress in anything because, because it's much, so much of a, a part of his life that he has to train four and a half hours every day. So I, that, that's, that's a, a, something for a lot of people that they kind of need to overcome and find that balance like where is it where's that minimum effective dose what's the what's the optimal amount of exercise that's going to get me fit and lean and strong and allow me to go about the rest of my day and do others because you know i'm not a professional athlete anymore. is there anything that you focused on regarding your diet over the years that you've looked back and realized that you put too much emphasis on it well i mean carbs i was in the in the 70s late 60s early 70s and 80s i was Carbo loading for every event that I did. I don't come close to that now. I, I'm a, sort of an anti-carb guy, so that was a that was the greatest revelation. And then I think what what I started talking about is re, as far back as 15 years ago, the industrial seed oils and the idea that many of the oils that we uh, have uh, that are incorporated into uh, processed foods are you know soybean oil and corn oil and 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 canola and highly uh, industrialized and processed oils that are antithetical to health. They're not, they're not helping us in any way. And in fact, may be harming our health. They may be a reason for insulin insensitivity, insulin resistance. They may be a reason for uh, higher inflammation in a lot of people. Uh, they may even impact um, neurology because so much of the brain is composed of fats. So that's another area that I started to investigate a long time ago. And if, um, I mean, the, I started a company in 2014 called Primal Kitchen, whose sole mission was to create 
oil-based products that used avocado oil as the, as the ingredient rather than these industrial seed oils. So I, that's another, so I'd say the carbs and the oils are the two big revelations. You know, maybe the, maybe the other revelation is that, you know, I, I don't think we need as much protein as the current leading, you know, voices in that arena are suggesting. I think it's, I still think we need a fair amount, like 100, 120 grams a day, but not not necessarily uh, a, a, um, a a gram per pound of body weight. What do you think of the biohacking space now? Like, I feel like there's always like some new gadget, some new supplement coming out. And I think that often confuses people as well. Look, I, I've said it. It's now one of my new themes. I think uh, biohacking is the day trading of the health space. Just as day traders want to circumvent the system, hop in there, not do their research or you know, do their research, but in terms of charts and historical buying patterns and where where the buyers and sellers are sitting so that they can extract money from them rather than investing in a company for the long term, for the benefits and for the dividends. I think that happens with with the longevity space and the wellness space. People are looking for these hacks. In fact, the term hack kind of has this meaning of inappropriate access to a system. And uh, so a lot of these hacks yeah, sound good, but many people are trying to look for a shortcut without doing the work, without really training their body to acclimate or adapt to a new strategy. They're just looking for quick fixes the way a, a day trader would be looking at a quick fix. Don't get me wrong. I'm not maligning day traders. I, I tried it for a while. It's a... <laughs> Uh, I lost a lot of money doing it, I, so I might have a little bit of a bias against that. But the idea, for instance, that you can burn more calories by sitting in a cold plunge than anything else is, it's just, it's just, I mean, you know, get on an assault bike sometime, you know, or a, or an ergometer of some, any, any type, a concept to rower or, or a skier. The idea that wrapping your legs up in a cryo, pad and then cycling for 10 minutes is the equivalent of a hour and 45 minute bike ride. This, this is, it just, that's not, that's, that's not how the body works. And so, you know, some of these things are kind of nice. I mean, I, I mean, I don't even like putting on a headset and getting the experience of having meditated for two days. I mean, please, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's, it all sounds cool. And you're all, you know, you're measuring, alpha waves and theta and your and many of the supplements again are 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 emerging having been dormant for 35 years since I started selling supplements back in the late 80s some of these supplements have come and gone three times and now they're reemerging as oh this is the new miracle stuff you know uh uh but it, these have uh been been proven to be, I mean I I made supplements I manufactured supplements for 35 years I don't really take supplements now. I don't think that they work as well as this minimalist type diet, which is, you know, clean, having eliminated the industrial seed oils and the sugars and the and the processed foods and coming down to meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruit, some starchy tubers. That's that's really all the body needs, partly because that's all the body lived on for the first two million years of human of humanoid existence and certainly the last 250 or 300,000 years of, of our hominid existence. So it, can you take a pill that's going to, I mean, I've traveled with some of the top and I've spoken at conferences with some of the top biohackers and, you know, the glasses and the pills and the, and the candy bars and the injections and the, I, 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 all, uh, by the way, in, in somehow the interest of, of living to be 160 or 180 years old, uh, which I don't, I still don't think we're going to see in our lifetime uh, and why, like, like I think uh, uh, 120 years is sort of the maximum lifespan that we've seen. Actually, 122 is the most ever recorded. And, you know, 90 is a good number for me. It's like, I don't need to, I watch too many old people right now who are in reasonably good at health who get up every day and go, eh, another day. What am I going to do? Well, you know, like read a book. That's fine. Whatever. But I think there's a there's a magic in the finality of life that make that gives it meaning, 
And so this notion of wanting to live forever, I don't understand the psyche behind it. I don't understand what the true motivation is other than, and I also, I see some people who are in pursuit of longevity so deeply and so single-mindedly focused that I don't even know if they enjoy their day-to-day living experience because they're so wrapped up in the protocols. Anyway, that's, that's my take on biohacking. I agree with you. And I'll also say, you know, like you, I have friends in the biohacking space and I have a lot of respect for what they do, certainly. And I have somebody who takes supplements, promotes supplements. I also think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in that a lot of times people in a lot of people in society today, they have a hard time putting in the work. So something flashy like biohacking and the quick fix is very appealing to them because it's more sexy, quote unquote, than what we know works and what's been proven by research that works and what's been proven by somebody like yourself that works and that moving your body consistently, resistance training, eating clean, getting good sleep, managing your stress, having good relationships, taking care of your mental health, like all that stuff like is it works, but it's not really sexy. I mean, it's just like the basics. So I think people are kind of looking for something different and outside of that to maybe short change their shortcut their way to that. And I think that the thing is like when people do, let's just say all that work, let's just say you could take a magic pill and, and you gave you all those things, you lose the biggest benefits from all that, which you mentioned the resilience and the discipline and embracing discomfort that like gets you ready for life. So, I mean, I totally agree with you. Are there any supplements that you still consistently take that you're keen on? I take vitamin D sporadically. Fract- fractally, as uh, as Art Devaney, my mentor, would say, I take a little bit. Of, I take collagen because I think it's a I think it's a major food group. I think it should be classified as a fourth macronutrient. Uh, and as you get older, collagen becomes a kind of a limiting factor. Your tendons and ligaments and connective tissue, fascia, all of that, which relies on those raw materials that are found in collagen. You know, I've, I've gone long periods of time without consuming collagen. And I've noticed the effects, the injury effects and things like that. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of collagen. You know, I, I do TRT, I do testosterone injection once a week and that I've been doing that for 10 years. So that's, that's a supplement beyond that. I, 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 what element is element a supplement? Um, (laughs) I love, we love element. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I drink element. Um, And that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm not doing any of the, you know, the new glutathione precursor things. I'm not really into the, um, um, you know, the BPC 157. I'm not, I'm I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm kind of old school with that right now. But, you know, for me, it feels like it's working great. I feel like I've, I've found I'm in the zone right now. You mentioned that you see certain people that are in their 60s. They just kind of do the same thing over and over again. And I think that's common when people, they, they set this goal. They're like, all right, I want 5 million in the bank. By the time I'm 65, I'm going to retire. And they get there. Then it's like, oh, like every day they get up, they eat the same thing for breakfast. They go for the same walk in the neighborhood. Maybe they play golf. Maybe they play tennis. And it becomes like Groundhog Day, I think, a lot of times. What are some of the things that you've done over the years that have just kept your mind fresh and young other than I know you mentioned you spend time with younger people, but for your like, what are some of like the, the weekly or daily habits that you do? Well, I'm, I'm always working on something. So I've got this new book that I've been working on for almost a year. It's coming out in October, Born, Born to Walk. I started a, a, a new shoe company with my son three years ago. We've got a meeting coming up after this podcast. Uh, you know, we, we do a interface almost every day. My son is the CEO. Um, we're We've we've invented, if you will, this new version of a five toed shoe. That uh, have you seen it? I have. I haven't tried them on, but I've seen them. They look really cool. I mean, that's all I brought with me to um, to Europe. This is my this is this is a this is the black the black version. So this is uh, a black a, a trainer. It's called the Strand. The company's called Paluva. It's a five toed shoe, and the whole concept is to um, feel like you're barefoot, but be able to navigate any surface, any man made surface, any cobbled surface, any any rocky surface, and that's had me extremely excited for all of the last three or four years that I've been working on this because I started thinking about it four years ago. So for me, it's always having 
a reason to, you know, get up in the morning and I, yeah, I got, I'm going to do my workout. I'm going to do my, you know, my standard set of puzzles that I do my brain work every morning, but then I've got to be productive. I've got to feel like I'm making a statement, making an impact on the world, either through my writing or through my inventions, you know, or creating products like Primal Kitchen or the supplements that I used to make or now the shoes. And so do you think that's what keeps you like going is that you feel like you have to just keep producing and just creating stuff? I do. You know, my wife is a whole different mindset. She's like, no, I just like life and I enjoy life. And I go <laughs> hang out with my girlfriends and I work out and I see my trainer and I see my stretching trainer and I see my, you know, and I, and I, she's got her schedule and she likes to travel. And so that's enough for her. When I'm traveling, I'm like, I got to schedule my meetings. I got to, you know, do all my, I'm here trying to think if I should get a, I, we just had our, our lenses replaced in our eyes, uh, speaking of biohacking. And uh, so I, I'm not seeing as well as I would like to yet. It's going it, to, it gets better over time. So now I'm thinking I got to buy a printer while I'm here so I can print out the last copy of the book before the, you know, do the final edits, you know, in order to do that. But I'm always trying to, to stay busy with something other than, sort of hobbies or frivolous stuff. Right. I've always wondered that question where, you know, people who have done very well for themselves, I'm like, well, why, why do you, why not just quit? <laughs> just like, <laughs> just like travel, play golf, like do whatever, like why keep doing things when you've done so well financially. But over the years I've learned like what you just said, like keeping the mind fresh and just, just the way you're wired to continue to work on something. And it's literally just the way I'm wired. It's not even, you know, I, I tried, being retired for a hot minute and it just didn't work for me. It was like, I was going crazy. So it, it was clear that I'm just always going to be working on something. And I, by the way, the one thing that the wealth affords me is I, at any time I can go, Nope, I'm done. Stop. You know, and now I can be retired, but, but I have the luxury of being able to say that without having to work. On the other hand, I get to choose to work every day. And I, I, I choose into it on a regular basis. And I suspect I'll, I learned this a little bit from my dad. My dad was a artist, a fine artist, a painter, and he painted paintings and he, he sold his first painting when he was 16, he got married when he was 23, uh, supported a family of a wife and four kids selling his paintings. He's been deceased for a bunch of years now, but he painted every day of his life until he died at the age of 87. And people used to say, wow, you must be passionate about painting. He said, I'm not, I'm not passionate. I'm obsessed. And for him, it was always, there was that one painting that he, that he just hadn't done that wasn't, you know, he wasn't quite satisfied with his body of work. And I think I picked that up from him. So, you know, it, it was a interesting, I, I picked a lot of things up from him in terms of like, you know, working for yourself, working out of the house, you know, he was a as a painter, he painted his studio was the back end of the house. So he, he would, you know, retire to the back end of the, to his studio every day and paint all day and emerge for, for, for dinner time. So I learned a lot of my habits from my dad. So whether that's wiring or just, you know, whether it's nurture versus nature, I don't know, but I just know that it's, that, that it's, in me that I have to be doing something. I interviewed somebody who ran one of the longest studies on happiness. I think it was like an 80 year study. And he was saying that one of their, their biggest findings was that the people who are like happiest later in life, they have meaningful relationships. You seem like a guy who's got a lot of good relationships. You just mentioned you have people who come and are staying with you frequently in Europe. Like what has, what, what has been the impact of meaningful relationships on your life as it comes, as it relates to longevity and everything we're talking about. So I've been married for 34 years, um, been with my wife for 36. Uh, that's, you know, a, a consistent relationship that's endured. Um, I wrote about this a couple of weeks ago in one of my, uh, Instagram and one of my blog posts that one thing I did not appreciate in my thirties and forties and fifties, as I was building businesses, was male friendship, my, my circle of male friends. I just was sort of, my priorities were family first. So I, you know, I went to every soccer practice. I went to every soccer game. I ref soccer, I ref, I, I coached little league. You know, I went, I taught the kids how to snowboard and boogie board and, 
and, and everything. I've spent time with the kids, I spent time with the family. Business was second, and I worked a lot at business. I didn't put in 90 hour weeks. I don't, I never believed in that, but I was, you know, I worked smarter, not harder in that regard. But I put a lot of time in there. And then I trained myself, right? I was still, even in my 30s, 40s, and 50s, I was still allocating a fair amount of time to to working out. So the idea of male friendship, I had guys who were friends, but like my son has six guys that are like tight, tight, tight. I mean, they've been together since high school and they're always going to be together. And they're, you know, they are best men at each other's weddings and, and they travel together and they, you know, they play golf on the weekends and they do all the things that, that guys do. And I really didn't have that until uh, I left Malibu and moved to Miami beach and moved to this building, this part of Miami beach that I'm in where I met, I've met you now 50 people that I really like, but, but seven or eight are guys who have become great friends and, and I've traveled around the world with them. I mean, what, what the, we've gone in the last four years, we've done, you know, can't even count the number of places, Italy, Greece, uh, Italy, three times, Greece, Croatia, Israel, you know, Egypt, uh, south of France, many times, and um, so it's a it's a whole new uh, experience for me to have close guy friends. Now, my wife's always had close girlfriends because she didn't work, and I was working, and she had the kids, so her thing was her her close girlfriend. So I sort of observed that, and then I uh, appreciate what my son has created with his close male friends. And so now I'm finally in my late sixties, I've finally found a, you know, a tribe of guys who are fit and willing to go work out. Uh, and yet, you know, smart enough to, to, uh, tell great stories and have, have a good time and talk politics and do all the things and smoke cigars and all that the guys do. That's amazing. That's so cool that you've been able to like do that throughout your career. I mean, not just have the meaningful relationships that you've built lately, but also like just being there as a dad for you know, your kids. I mean, I just think that they, I'm sure really, really value that. I mean, I would tell most dads out there that, that that is the thing kids value the most. It's the time you spend with them. You know, not the stuff you buy them, not the opportunities that you afford them. It's the time you spend with them. And to that point, I know something that I struggled with in my twenties was, I guess you would call it orthorexia. Now they call it, I guess, maybe a little bit of that and body dysmorphia where, I over indexed so much on my health that I was afraid to go out and socialize because I was afraid, like, okay, I can't go to a restaurant because I can't eat healthy. I can't go to this party because I might, you know, eat pizza or whatever. And I ended up in, I ended up sacrificing relationships and I realized I was just miserable. Like I'd be at home on a Friday night by myself. Like, did you, did you ever struggle with any of that? Well, I mean, I, I, that's one of the reasons I didn't have the you know, I, I didn't hang out with the boys. Um, I was in my twenties and thirties, I was an athlete. So I was, I would go up to the city on a night of carousing with the guys and it'd be quarter of 11. And I'd ask for the car keys to go sleep in the back seat until they were ready to go home. I mean, I was already, you know, I was already, uh, tapping out early and I learned, so I learned that, you know, I did not want to sacrifice the hundred mile bike ride I had planned for the next day because I had, um, you know, seven extra beers that night. So yeah, I had, I had that, but I, you know, I wouldn't call that body dysmorphia or, or orthorexia. I call that just discipline, right? I, I was, you know, when you're, when your choice is, you know, go make bad decisions with guys or, or go to bed, get a good night's sleep and wake up the next morning and get a good workout in when your primary focus is your athletics, that makes sense. Um, what doesn't make sense is, not find time for yourself on a Saturday afternoon to go play golf with, with a bunch of really good buddies and, you know, share stories and, and, uh, you know, have barbecues, you know, with them and the families. We just sort of didn't do that. And part of that was my settings. I, I Malibu is a very a remote part of Los Angeles. You got to get in your car to do anything you to drive, to go, to go work out, to get a cup of coffee, to buy a paper, to go for a hike, you know, so it was not conducive to, close contact, close regular contact with uh, even even good friends. Some of the most beautiful running trails, though, in Malibu, I can tell you that, in the Santa Monica Mountains. For sure. I, I, I would go up there and get lost for two and a half or three hours. Back in the days of early triathlon training, when I coached some of the top triathletes 
in the world, we would go up there in our speedos and no shirts and nothing else and run for two and a half hours just in, in that, on those amazing trails. It was some of the most incredible uh, training experiences I ever had. Yeah. I think my favorite is the, was it Coral Canyon, like the backbone, like that trailhead. Does that sound familiar? Corral Canyon. Yeah. Last question. I know you got this book coming out called Born to Walk. Walking's obviously become very popular over the last few years. Talk about the importance of walking. Uh, it, walking is the quintessentially human movement pattern, right? We were literally were born to walk. We're bipedal. We have to walk. We, you know, if we don't, we don't stand around a lot. If we, we, we fall, we fall over if we don't walk. I mean, we, uh, but, but what, where we get caught up is people think, well, running is better than walking. Well, no, we're born to walk. We're born to be able to run, but not run on a regular basis. We're born to walk and we're born to sprint. And so I'm trying to tell people, look, the whole movement pattern of walking is engaging the entire kinetic chain from the bottoms of the feet all the way up to the neck uh, in a way that, that your own biomechanics works perfectly. And one of the caveats I have, and one of the reasons I started the, the shoe company was if we're not walking barefoot, then we are counteracting all of the all of the sensory input that the bottoms of our feet require in order to tell the brain exactly how to flex the arch, to bend the toes, to to bend the knee, to tilt the hip forward. Walking reinforces this perfect biomechanical uh, gait that that all of us are born with, but that we all tend to screw up because we either wear crappy thick shoes that are overbuilt, over indexed for comfort, as you would say. And, uh, you know, we, we, and I'm telling people get back to like more of a minimalist footwear, barefoot style, walk as much as you can, sprint once in a while, lift weights, you'll be the fittest, happiest, healthiest person you can be. As I'm getting ready to go for a run in my hocus, uh, <laughs> I'll have to get your, I'll have to get a pair of your, of your, of your shoes and try them. No, I mean, look, the, the guy who, who was the first hire of Hoka works for me now. And, uh, he's, he's, he's my chief product officer. And, uh, you know, so he'll, he'll tell you stories about Hoka, but you know, it was, it was a good shoe at the time because everybody wanted thickness. But we're, what we're learning now is that the, the foot needs to feel the ground underneath. So your shoes need to be wide, thin, flat, and flexible. And then we're arguing that, that your toes need to articulate individually. Your toes need to feel the ground underneath. So if you, if I, if I step on this and my toes uh, are able to sense even the shape of the stone underneath or the stick or the divot or the pothole, that's a good thing. And that all transmits to the brain. You can't do that with Hocus, but you can do that barefoot and you can do that with minimalist footwear. So we're on a mission to change the way the world moves. I love it, Mark. Well, thanks again for coming on the podcast. This was an awesome conversation. A lot of lessons, a lot of takeaways. If people want to connect with you, if they want to perhaps pre-order a copy of the book, they want to learn more about what you're doing with your companies, where's the best place to do that? On Instagram, I'm Mark Sisson Primal. And then, you know, I've had this blog, Mark's Daily Apple for a long time. But I would say Mark Sisson Primal on Instagram is the best place to, you know, find out a little bit about what I'm doing. I post three times a week there with some nugget of information and I'm, I'll be announcing uh, when to when the book is available for pre-sale pre and all that good stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on once again. Uh, I love the conversation. It was great to, to finally connect with you and I appreciate your time. Thanks, Doug. Take care. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.